Uh, we've Keen here will be asking Dave questions at the end. And we've our guest, uh, David Samuel, who we just had on the podcast last week. We had a great episode with him, which went down really well. And it's great to have this opportunity to dive in deeper with Dave and find out more of his expertise and how you can apply it to our game. And yeah, Dave, so we're going to kick off straight into Dave. Dave is, if you have any questions, leave them in the Q&A and we will get to them. Dave is just back from a trip in Portugal. Uh, I'm not sure if he wants to tell, he just told me about it. Not sure if he wants to tell you about that, but uh, here we go, Dave, welcome. And we're going to just shut our, mon we're going to shut our cameras off here so you can take the floor and get straight into it. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. And it's uh, good to speak to you again <laughs> so soon, yeah. um, but uh, brilliant. Uh, I'll just uh, share my screen here. Uh, right. If I can just get a thumbs up uh, or a couple of thumbs up that everybody can see this nice and clearly and can hear me clearly. Uh, I can get I can get cracking. It's all good, Dave. It's good. All good. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for for joining us. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is how to manage your tennis brain, which, as we know, is pretty damn important if you're going to be very good at the game of tennis. Um, as uh, Fabio just said, I just got back from uh, Portugal and, uh, you know, Liam Brody, who, who I coach, has been doing extremely well, but he hadn't been home since the 28th of January. So it gives you an indication of, you know, obviously with COVID and some of the restrictions, it was a lot easier for him to stay out on the road than to come back to the UK. Uh, but that mentally is quite a challenge. So it's another indication of, of what you need sometimes and the resilience and fortitude you need to play this game of tennis. Um, so uh, certainly Portugal, I think, was a tournament too far for him. And, uh, you know, I flew in on a, on a Friday morning, practiced at 12. Uh, the weather was actually not very good at all. So it rained at quarter to one and wiped us out. And then, uh, uh, and he had flown there from Serbia, where he'd made the semifinals and done really well. And um, then Saturday morning, 11, he was on first, played a, a pretty tight match with a, with a good Portuguese player who'd done very well in college tennis, made the finals of NCAAs, uh, but he lost that match. And now finally he's back for, for a rest. And, uh, uh, it is important also to get enough rest when when you play uh, a lot of competitive tennis. So how to manage your brain. Um, basically, uh, we have three brains in one. We have the subconscious, the emotional brain, and the logical brain. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today and how fantastic these brains are, but also how they interact with each other. And these are, these are kind of the voices that you have in your head. Uh, and, and if you can understand how the brain works, uh, it, this awareness can really help you improve. So uh, amazing automation. You know, when's the last time any of you woke up in the morning and said, you know, I just hope I can remember to breathe today, or I hope I don't fall over today when I'm walking. You know, I hope my heart keeps beating. Well, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Because we know that all happens automatically. So the subconscious brain basically has automated so much for us. And uh, that's, you know, the part of the first part of the brain we're going to talk about is the subconscious brain. So how long does it take a baby to walk? Well, you know, kids start walking at different ages, but it's around about the 18 month, two year, two year mark. And, you know, to walk 
pretty well. They probably get into the two and a half where they can, you know, start to jump and run uh, quite well and everything. And, you know, we would never say, oh, that's really slow because actually you would think to automate all of that is, you know, it's actually pretty quick. And the same thing to talk well. You know, I think, you know, kids by the time they're three years old are talking pretty well and you just, you know, I have a grandchild and it's just amazing the words that he comes out with and you think, where did he ever hear of this? So they're like sponges, take it in. And all the time, the subconscious brain is automating this stuff uh, so that, you know, the kid just doesn't have to think about walking anymore and doesn't have to think about talking. It becomes more and more automated. Then as we get older, we get into a sport such as tennis. Now, if you think about it, you know, serving, you know, coordinating all of these movements in tennis, which is, you know, forehands, backhands, volleys, you know, slice, topspin. This is an amazingly complex sport to learn. And you've got to do it at high speed. So if you think about it, you know, it's, it's, it's very lucky that our subconscious brain is actually our best friend and doesn't have any judgment. And the reason why this is, uh, you know, very helpful to us is, can you imagine it's automated all of these complex movements and then you miss one forehand. It's like, you know, I can't believe I can miss this forehand and everything, you know, because you know, the subconscious brain slightly miscalculated the timing on a forehand. It'd be a little bit unfair. But uh, your subconscious brain has no judgment, okay? It's only there, and its only job is to help you get what you want. It is a fantastic piece of machinery in your head that all it wants to do is serve you and give you what you want. And it responds to the stories that you tell it, to the choices that you make. Now, I've called the subconscious brain the elephant. Why? Because the subconscious remembers everything that you've done in, in your life. It's got this amazing storage, and, and it, it, it has all of this within you. And when you ask it for something, so if you said to, to, to your elephant, uh, I'd like to rob a bank. Immediately, and this is how the subconscious operates, it'll dive down and look at everything that you've done and everything that you know to find evidence to help you rob a bank. Now, of course, uh, it's not going to find very much evidence there. So you'll, you know, sort of get ideas of, you know, having to look up on Google how to rob a bank. But the thing about it is because it has no judgment, it's not going to say to you, uh, by the way, this is not really a good idea because you might go to prison. Okay. All it does is try to help you. And if you insist that you want to rob a bank, it'll try to help you rob a bank. And uh, it's, it's not going to judge you whether it's a good or, or, or not a good thing to do. Then we go to the emotional brain. And the emotional brain, I'm going to call the male line because it's very, very dangerous. So basically the emotional brain is incredibly powerful and it is much more powerful than the logical brain. And when it gets aroused, it's very dangerous. Okay, so if you take that onto a tennis court, basically, if you miss a ball and you get angry, that's an emotion. And if the, the anger really gets high, uh, the reason it's dangerous in a tennis match is because the emotional brain will totally take over. And the only messaging that your subconscious brain will get is from the emotional brain, which is, you know, I can't believe I'm so useless. That's such a terrible shot. Now, of course, a lot of this dialogue is happening in your head. All right. And immediately that messaging is going into your subconscious brain and your subconscious brain immediately starts diving in and looking for evidence to help prove that you are useless, that you can't hit a backhand or you can't hit a forehand or you always miss easy volleys on big points. So uh, what this is setting up 
is, you know, if you're going to play very good tennis, you're going to have to find a way to soothe the emotional brain so that it doesn't get highly aroused, uh, aroused and take over. Fundamentally, the emotional brain is lazy. Okay, male lions love to just lie in the sun or in the shade and do very little. The, the, the male lion doesn't even really hunt that much. Okay, what it does is it'll get up when it's hungry and it'll go and walk on one side of a, a, a herd of deer. They'll see it or smell it and start to gravitate in another direction where the female lions are waiting to actually hunt. And they'll catch a, a, a deer and then the male lion will saunter in and eat first. And, uh, and then the, the female lions and the cubs can eat after him. So fundamentally, unless you arouse the emotional brain, it, it's lazy and will not get too involved in your, in your everyday life. Okay, but as we know, it doesn't take much to arouse the emotional brain, the lion, and for the emotions to start to try and take over. The emotional brain on a tennis court seems like a, a, a bad thing. You know, you hear a lot about controlling emotions. You cannot control emotions. All right, what you can do is learn how to manage them. And that's what we're going to get into in a minute. But the emotional brain also has a unique connection to the subconscious. Now, your subconscious does have one way of letting you know whether something is good for you or not. But we don't listen to it very often. And that's called your sixth sense, your gut instinct. So sometimes on a tennis court, you know, uh, you got to play percentage tennis and you're playing your game and everything like that, but suddenly you get a, a gut feeling that you need to go and do something different. Now, what we're going to get into is the logical brain who will not recognize the gut feeling, but the emotional brain will. So sometimes playing aroused and a bit angry to get energy or to listen to gut feeling and do something totally different is very important. So being in tune with your emotions is also a very good thing. Uh, and it's not all bad. But of course, in managing your emotions, you've got to get better and better at knowing when this is an instinct or whether it's just a takeover. Okay, so spontaneity and, and being in touch with the gut is, is, is great for our lives because that allows us to do things impulsively and, you know, get happy very quickly sometimes or, you know, appropriately sad. Uh, so, you know, the emotional brain has a very important part to play, but we have to learn how to manage it. The owl, the logical brain, smart and logical. The other thing, okay, so the logical brain is like uh, a, a computer in your head that looks at everything and tries to make good decisions. The other thing that the logical brain can do far better than the emotional brain is fly up the owl and have a good look at the tennis court and see what's really going on there and take and get a, a much bigger vision rather than just the intensity of just one point or you know one game that's been lost. So sometimes on a tennis court, it's not a bad little visual to have is, you know, on a changeover, you know, get my owl, the logical brain, just to, you know, get a bird's eye view of what's really going on. And that can often calm you down, say, oh, hold on a second, it's just one game. You know, the match is not over. Yeah, it's not ideal, but, I'm, you know, I can still win this thing. Uh, and also the... The logical brain is a good leader when it can stay uh, uh, within control of what's going on and, and the emotional brain doesn't take over. So if you can think if an owl is there and uh, the lion gets you know, really angry or disappointed or you know, any you know, negative emotion and takes over the show, the owl doesn't have a chance to, to, to put its messaging through 
to the subconscious brain. So what we want is for the owl to be able to give logical messages to the subconscious brain, which uh, are, you know, okay, you know, we lost that set point, but let's go again. It's not the end of the world. And to soothe the emotional brain, the emotional brain starts to get agitated. It's like, you know, remember, you know, we've talked about this, you know, leave it to us. Don't worry, you'll get fed. Everything's okay. The messaging system is simply this. Your subconscious, which automates everything, and of course, we all play our best when we're not thinking, when it's just allowing this automation to take place. But of course, you know, the zone that we call that uh, uh, doesn't last for any human being throughout a whole match, very rarely. So when we start to think, we need to make sure that we're thinking mostly with the logical brain. Because, you know, even if you get this 50-50 where the emotions are fighting with the logical brain, think about it. The subconscious is getting two messages. The emotional message, which is, you know, uh, if I lose this, then my you know ranking goes down, my rating goes down, and then I can't play this tournament and that, and you know all the babble starts. And then the logical brain is saying, "No, we're still in this. You know, we can do it." If you think about it, the the uh, subconscious brain doesn't make judgment. Okay, so it's going to try and serve both of these brains, and basically, it's like coming to a T junction and saying, "Right, uh, you know." I've got to listen to the emotional brain and the logical brain equally in this situation. And the one saying you must turn left and the other saying you must turn right. And you're not allowed to, you know, the, the subconscious is not going to make a judgment as to who's right or wrong. All it is is going to try and deliver for both. So what happens is basically it freezes because it doesn't know what to do. It's been giving two conflicting messages and doesn't know what to do. And therefore, in tennis terms, when you freeze, you know, your legs get heavy, you know, you hesitate a little bit, and the automation basically doesn't work as well as it, it, it can do. And that's what causes real problems when you're playing, is, you know, once you get to that place where the, the, the subconscious is, you know, confused and, 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 you know, feels like it's at a T-junction, um, you know, it, all automation slows down and, and you can't really think straight either. And you just got this battle in your head. So what you're trying to do is get one message as much as possible going through to the subconscious. And you want that coming, you know, mostly from the logical brain. How do you do this? Well, it's, all starts before you compete, before the match. You need to prepare the lion. It's like the logical brain talking to the emotional brain and saying, look, you know, in tennis matches, things get tough. There is always a crisis somewhere or another. You know, emotional brain, okay, don't worry. When this happens, you know, I, I will take care of it. You know, this is what I do. I will manage a situation, relax, you will still get fed, okay? And that way, there's a good chance that in a match, when you want to talk, you know, and, and quieten your uh, emotional brain down, that it's well prepared. And when you start to talk to it and soothe it, it will listen. If you don't prepare it, it's highly unlikely it will listen. And this is when, when, we, when you start to get really mental toughness, uh, on board. The owl must calm the line and control the messaging before the start of the next point. It is so, so crucial. Okay, and how do you do this? Well, okay, you, you know, if the owl can give one message, it gives it, the elephant a chance to re-automate. So even if the emotional brain is cut in, when the logical brain says, whoa, cut out, 
it's okay, all right? Uh, and you become aware that that the emotional brain is, you know, starting to take over and you quieten it down, okay? The logical brain also then starts to become aware of, of overthinking, okay? And that damages the, the elephant's automation, you know, this all this babble, blah, 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 which starts with a battle between the emotional and the logical brain. So the, the, the logical brain is going to say, hold on a second, you know, one thing, focus on one thing only, you know, move your feet, watch the ball, uh, watch the ball one second longer, uh, you know, uh, uh, calm down, you can do this. Uh, you need to create some tools that work for you that the logical brain can use to quieten the babble, okay? And also um, to keep the emotional brain uh, out of it. So because the emotional brain will get very agitated if a lot of dialogue is going on in your head. The other thing that's really important is the tone of voice that you use with your internal dialogue. You know, if you say, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Or you say, oh my goodness, I can't believe I missed that. Same words, but a different meaning because of the, the, the tone of voice. So this is what makes somebody mentally tough. An incident on the court happens. You know, miss an easy volley on, on a break point. The emotion will hit. That's human. You know, a little bit of disappointment or a little bit of anger or frustration. Whatever the emotion is for you on that day, it'll hit. But here's the trick, you know, when you walk back to get your towel, take a couple of deep breaths. You need to create a space to allow the owl to talk to the lion and say, okay, yes, that's disappointing, but we still got a job to do. It'll be okay. Remember, we spoke about this before the match, you know, leave it to me now. Uh, we'll be okay. You know, just watch the ball. Now, obviously, you you know, this happens very, very fast. And, and, and the reality is the incident happens, the emotion hits, you know, take a couple of deep breaths. Okay, you know, right, you know, watch the ball or, you know, you know, you know watch out for his uh, wide serve now. And, you know, you have these coping strategies that you have in place and that's going to affect your behavior in the next point. Now, I hope this all makes sense to you um, and that you're going to, you know, understand that these three brains, you know, all work together, but you have an internal dialogue, which is basically the emotional brain uh, and uh, the logical brain, you know, having this kind of dialogue between each other. This is a voice in your head and it switches from emotional to logical. And if you can keep it, more in the logical when you're playing tennis, learn how to soothe the, the emotional brain. Then in these spaces, you will think better and therefore your behavior in the next point will not be uh, irrational. So where, you know, you're so angry at going to the next point, you hardly see the ball and, and just, you know, you know, hit as hard as you can and, and try to get rid of the pressure that way and it's, and, and it's all emotional. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, open for questions. Good, man. You may have to just turn off your screen here. I can do it here. Oh, okay. Dave, that was great. Uh, thanks a lot. Lock on with those animals there. Uh, but for me, uh, what I picked up there, a lot of it is, for, sorry, what I picked up the most is just your internal dialogue for me would be the most important that if you can control that and be positive and say the right, know what to say to yourself, I think you got to train, you got to do a bit of research and speak to the right people about it. And if you can say the right things yourself, a lot of things fall off that. Yeah, am I right there? Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, the first step that I always try to get players to do is to get the tone right. Because once you talk more calmly, even if it's panic talk, like, you know, I can't believe this is happening to me or can't believe this is happening to me. 
that starts to already dampen down emotion and, 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 and immediately give you a calmer feel. Of course, if you can have the calmer feel and, and talk, you know, positively. So, you know, it, it's no point in a match denying, like if you miss an easy set point, you know, it's no point in denying that doesn't hurt. But it's like, okay, that hurts, but we know this happens in tennis. Go again, you know, just fight again. You know, one point doesn't win a tennis match, you know, and, and that way, you know, and if you can do it calmly, your brain gets better and better at this. And, and you know, I'll go to a few more questions, but I can tell you a quick story about Nadal, which, uh, which I think illustrates this. He's been doing it for so long that, you know, his emotions don't hit that hard because they know that in the space after the emotion hits, he is going to turn it around and make it very, very positive. He's going to see everything in a, in a, in a, in a you know, and, 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 and see a way to, to turn it into a positive. So the emotion, the, the line basically pretty lazy is like, why bother getting really angry because he's going to turn it around anyway. And, and, you know, he's got the discipline to never allow me to take over. So I'm not going to really fight it. So he doesn't actually feel the emotions as high as some, you know, you know, junior players or, or less experienced players. And that's what you're trying to do as you get more and more experienced and, and better at creating the space and talking to yourself. Well, then, um, then, you know, you don't have to deal with actually as much emotion. And you know, obviously the better you are at this, the more feared player you become because people know this guy is like a fortress. That's correct. Great. Well, uh, Keen, maybe Keen can check any questions there. We can start far and away. If anybody has any questions, add them in and we will start asking. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have quite a few questions in already, David. Um, start you off right. with uh, Aditya. She's asking kind of what percentage breakdown do you spend in a competitive match between the three brain types? So between the subconscious, the emotional and the logical, or do you have a breakdown of them? Uh, I mean, there isn't a breakdown because ideally you want to be just playing from the subconscious automated. And, you know, that, that's what we call the zone where everything's just happening automatically. The, the thoughts are, are, are very quiet in the back of your mind. You, you, you're reading the play and everything like that. And that's the ideal place to be. Um, once you fall out of that state and start thinking, so something happens that knocks you out of that state and you start thinking, then uh, ideally most of the time is spent in the, in the logical brain trying to, you know, keep the emotions calm and allow the automation to still work pretty well. Uh, that's the, that's the aim. What happens with players is they get into this battle, the, the, the emotions hit and then the logical brain's trying to get a message in, but it, the emotions are just so high that they've taken over. And then the messaging going to, to the, the subconscious to, to the elephant is, is a, a lot of gibberish, a lot of panic, a lot of negative stuff. And, and of course, then all the subconscious is doing is looking for evidence for why you write. And, and therefore, it's a very swift downward spiral then. So the discipline is to keep quieting down the emotional brain. And, you know, sometimes you can have to do it maybe 100, 200 times in a match. You know, it's like, you know, oh, I can't believe it's happening. Shh, it's okay. Relax. You can, you can do this. You know, just watch the ball. And then four points have gone by and you realize you can't even remember them. You know, what's happened? Your, your brain has been in such turmoil and, and, and then, but you need to bring it back. And, and that's the discipline that you've got to keep bringing to the table and just until you get very good at it and you'll find slowly but surely, you know, you don't have to do it quite as much. But in the beginning, you have to do it a lot. And that's everybody has to learn. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, look, it, it makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to uh, Aditya who asked the question. Um, yes, I hope so. 
we have a question here, and I was actually thinking it myself. I think every tennis player has been there, um, lead up to a big match. You know, you start to overthink it, maybe get a bit nervous. Maybe you're lying in bed the night before, and you know, how do you control those thoughts and kind of turn them into positive ones? Okay, very good question. Um, the the first thing I think is to understand that you know in tennis you can win and you can lose and if you lose what's really going to change are you going to stop playing tennis are you going to stop practicing or are you going to carry on well the answer is i'm going to carry on so if you lose you know you're going to learn something and carry on if you're not going to carry on then it is simply the match of your life that if you're only going to carry on if you win and uh you know good luck to you because <laughs> if, if you do that for every match you're soon going to run into that match that you lose because everybody loses um so the fact that you're going to carry on means that okay so every match is actually just a chance to learn to get better it's great if you win the match and you're going to fight hard to win the match but what you don't want to do is give the match away because you're afraid of the other person or you're afraid of, 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 of losing. So the thought process there is, you know, think about the other person and go, you know, ask yourself questions like this, okay? Is it possible that they'll be nervous? Yes. Now, do I know what's going on in their life? You know, maybe the dog died and the next day they're going to be a mess and not play very well. You know, you, you just don't know. So you don't know really what you're going to face until you walk on the court. So there's no point in thinking too much and, and uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? You know, trying to perceive all of the options that are available because there, there are countless options. So just accept that you don't know what's going to happen until you go on the court in their mind. The other thing you want to say to yourself is, am I prepared to lie here in bed and accept that the other person is mentally stronger than me and will be able to deal with this far better than I will? Or am I going to say, you know what? I don't know how strong they are mentally, but I do know that I'm getting better very quickly mentally. And I love the test of going out there to see if, I'm actually mentally as strong or stronger than this other person, but I'm not going to accept before the match that I'm definitely mental, mentally weaker. Don't always automatically make yourself the underdog, you know, because you don't know if you're playing, you know, I, I would advise, you know, you know, players that, that I work with, you know, and I've had players playing the number one in the world and say, hold on, you know, you're not playing the guy on TV in the finals of Wimbledon. You're playing the guy in the first or second round and you don't know what's going on in his life and who's going to show up there. You don't know how good he's actually going to be. So play the person on the day and be prepared to do that. I mean, there, there are some other things, of course, that I can bring to it, but I want to get on to more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Here, we'll move on to another one. This one's from Brielle. And Brielle's saying, the way I play in matches is very different from the way that I play in practice. What's a good first step to start controlling the emotional brain in matches? Because... Maybe you're cool, calm, and collected in practice, and maybe it all goes out the window, you know, when you get into the match setting. Um, very, another very good question. Uh, one of the things I, I would do is start putting something on practice sets. So whether it's something physical, you're going to do like 20 push-ups or something, or whoever loses, or you know, buy a drink or whatever put something on it just to put a little bit of pressure on. So it's practice matches mean a little bit more and start getting used to, to dealing with a little bit of pressure in practice, which, which is helpful. Uh, the second thing to understand is it's very, very common. Most people until they get very experienced. Okay. Play better and looser in practice. And even to a very high level, you know, I've, you know, I remember seeing a particular player last year at the French Open who, who practiced against Liam, you know, beat him six love in a set, playing amazing tennis, 
And then the next day we saw him in the match and pushing the ball around. So that's at a very, very high level. So this, this is not an uncommon thing. So don't feel like it's just totally personal to you. Um, the other thing is in matches, really, the only way to learn how to deal with pressure in matches better is in matches and get the discipline to keep quieting down your, your emotional brain. And as I said before, over and over again, until it basically starts to listen and you start to get more and more logical in matches. Uh, passion. Is passion a good thing? Can passion be a bad thing if there's too much of it? Um, because obviously it all kind of plays into the emotional uh, setting and the brain and everything like that. Can, maybe you can talk yeah. a tiny bit about that. Um, I mean, passion can be both for sure. Um, I'd say in general, uncontrolled passion uh, generally gets players in trouble. It can work for a short little period of time, you know, just, you know, on a height of emotion, and everything like that. But when you're very passionate, there's a lot of energy flooding into your body. It's the same as getting very, very angry. There's a lot of energy. And when you have this flood of energy at some point, and, and, and it's such high energy, it, it doesn't last for that long before you, you go flat. And when you go flat, uh, you know, if the other person's, you know, keeping the, the, the pressure on, it's very hard to, you can't keep summoning passionate energy. It, you know, it, it kind of drives out and it's, it's actually very tiring to play on passion. So that's one thing to rem remember is that, you know, uh, passion is, is, is takes a lot of energy um, for, for, you know, a few points here and there, obviously it can be very, very helpful. Um, there was a second thing about passion that, that I wanted to say is, yeah, of course, passion is driven mostly from the emotional brain. So it's kind of taking over. And again, you know, in, in tennis, uh, being too happy in a situation is just as dangerous as being, you know, too negative. Uh, so, you know, if you can, if you get very, very passionate and, uh, you know, come on, you can win this. And, and, and I remember Leighton Hewitt, one of the big changes for him, uh, you know, as he came on the pro tour, incredible passion and everything like that. And, and I remember him saying that, you know, if he got to break point, he'd be like, come on, but then he realized that so much emotion that he had played the, the break point often very flat. So he learned to not celebrate till after he had actually broken and then not too much because you still had a hold serve. And so he started to really control the, the, the passion for the right moments in the match. And again, that is something you have to learn as a player for yourself. Everybody's different is when to allow some passion to emerge and when not, you know, Nadal is obviously a, a great example of that. Um, uh, Serena Williams is another great example of, of often using passion and, 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 you know, high energy for short periods of time. Uh, we have a question here and this person has difficulty with motivation and discipline when they're playing against an easier opponent, but when they're playing against someone that they know is better than them, they're all kind of zoned in, you know, they're like ready to go. How do you kind of get that same discipline when you're playing someone that you know, like is below your level? So maybe you're, maybe don't have that same interest in it. I love this question and I'll fire one back, which is what kind of person do you want to be? Entitled? Because if you struggle for motivation and you know, uh, uh, and and if you're much better than somebody, you 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 don't really bring a hundred percent to the table because you don't need to, and that's an entitled attitude. Like, hey, you know, I'm going to win this, so I don't need to really put in that much motivation uh, or energy into this. Or do you want to be a humble person? And a humble person is somebody. Okay, who respects every opponent, and they show that respect by 
uh, leaving no stone unturned for whoever they play against, that they come to the table uh, uh, ready to play no matter who. And if they can beat someone six love, six love, they respect them enough to do that because that shows the person what they need to do to get better. And the sense of pride uh, to always do your best is, is, is part of being humble because it's only entitled people who make the decision, oh, I'm better than this person. You know, I'll, I'll just gauge how much effort I need to put in because it's also a dangerous game. Because you know, I've seen people get bitten very badly by coming into a match all complacent and yeah, you know, I, I always beat this person. But of course, this person has been practicing, improved quite a lot, you know, is having a great day, and suddenly they are set down, and now the panic is really bad because the mental state is I can't lose to this person. You know, how can I lose to this person? You know, I've been telling everybody how rubbish they are. And, and you, you put an enormous amount of pressure on yourself. It's, it's actually, you know, quite arrogant to not bring your best to the court every time. Because also, what are you practicing for yourself? You know, that I need to always gauge how much energy and how much uh, uh, effort I'm going to put into a match and how much motivation I need in order to win a match. I mean, wow. It's a, that. You know, that's also a really big problem to solve all the time, to gauge it perfectly. So it's far easier to be humble and say, my job when I go out here is to play as hard as I can against everybody. And uh, there's no finer example of, of that than, than, than Rafa Nadal. You know, he, he will beat somebody one and one if he can. Uh, and Steffi Graf was another great one at that. You know, if, if I can beat someone in 40 minutes, I do it. If it takes me an hour and a half, it takes me an hour and a half. If it takes me three hours, it takes me three hours. But I always bring the same energy to the court. Uh, if we talk about sleep and diet, we've heard it so many times on, on the podcast here that Fabio runs and the webinars also. Um, do sleep and diet, how do they play a role and how can they really kind of affect your brain when you play tennis? Um. I would say test it, okay? Try play tennis, if, if you're playing a lot of tennis, on six hours of sleep a night for a week or two weeks and see how well you play and see how irritable you are on the court and how well you can control uh, uh, your, your inner dialogue and how much you don't get irritable. The other test is, you know, Go and eat a Big Mac and then go out and play and see how you feel out on the court. You know, and if you feel great on that Big Mac, then I'll say, fine, eat it. But there's not many people who feel great on the court after eating a Big Mac and Coke and fries, you know, uh, an hour before they play and, and, and feel really good on the court. So, you know, everybody is different and, and, and diet, you know, you still have to find out for yourself. For, so, for instance, I know when I played, I was far better with less in my stomach than a lot. But I know players who, who need, you know, a lot of fuel to play well. Uh, you know, uh, there are players that will have an espresso just before they go out on the court. They need that lift and they feel that they play really well on it. Now, you know, some players get the shakes after an espresso and couldn't play. So it's, there's no one size fits all, but I can tell you this. If you fuel yourself on junk food and then go play and see how you feel and then fuel yourself on, on, on healthy food and go and see how you feel, you will know the difference for yourself. Nobody has to tell you. We have a question here from Jay and Jay's asking what typical what typical things can we do on a daily basis to work on our mental game? So it doesn't necessarily, it can be on the practice court. Maybe it doesn't have to be on the practice court. Um, maybe you can offer us a few uh, ideas there. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important every day. And, and 
you know, to practice mental skills. If somebody, you know, cuts you up while you're driving or does something that really annoys you, this is practice right there and then because your emotion hits and, ah, I can't, whoa. Take a couple of deep breaths, create a space and go, okay, what's really going on here? You know, do I need to get annoyed? Calm down, Mr. Lion. All right. It's not such a big deal. You know, which is going to be like 30 seconds later. It's fine. And it's amazing if you start to bring this, creating that space and disciplining your mind off the court, how much that will help you on the court because your brain gets used to the fact that you're going to cut in when the emotions hit high and, you know, bring some logic to it. Uh, it's really important before practice, before matches and on the day of, you know, and, and, and really every day to prepare yourself that this is what you're going to do. Because if you don't say in the morning, you know what, when things get hairy, I'm going to really work hard to create a space and calm myself down. There's very little chance you're going to do it. So, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot to prepare for the day but you really want to prepare your mind. Say, you know, uh, what kind of person do I want to be? Somebody who, when the emotion hits, will create space and, you know, like the owl, maybe just take a little bird's eye view and say, is this really worth getting very annoyed about or very frustrated about? And, you know, that's practicing over and over again. Uh, but again, it starts with the at the beginning of the day to say, and different times of the day, when you feel you've had a situation that you haven't handled well, go, oh, right. When this happens again, I'm going to handle myself much better. So there are you know, countless opportunities in life to practice for tennis. I hope that helps. Uh, we have a question here from Alexandra and Alexandra either has or works with a 10 year old um, playing high level competitive junior tennis. Um, but he's having trouble, he's starting to feel pressured and can't really control his emotions. If you were to actually talk to a 10 year old and kind of break it down really simply for a child, you know, what would you say to them? Um, well, I'd certainly use the elephant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and the lion and, and the owl, uh, obviously in, in very simple terms, it, I would, I would say, look, you know, you want to be automated. And that's the goal. When your brain gets involved, okay, it's, it's, you know, which is, you know, the lion, it becomes very difficult to play. So what you're trying to do is to always bring the owl into play and play with the owl and the elephant rather than the lion and the elephant. Uh, another thing about pressure, uh, explaining to the kid that, you know, losing is very much part of the game as is winning. And, it, you know, the, the best players in the world can lose 50% of their matches and still be ranked 40 in the world. So, you know, that, Winning every match is not the goal. The goal is to get better after every match, win or lose. And, you know, pressure for, you know, ratings and all of that uh, is, you know, try to, try to make it like a computer game that, look, all you're doing is playing levels and you're on this level and you're trying to get to the next level. And what happens in a computer game? If you, if you get eaten or you die or whatever it is that takes you up the level, you just go again and play again until you get good enough to get to that level. So see it as an adventure that you're just trying to go up and up through the levels of a game. And guess what? You know, when the game is finished and you've done all the levels and you can do all the levels well, you know, you'd get bored with the game. So you buy a new one and start all over again, which is more difficult. So that's all tennis is. You just keep 
you know, trying to get better and better. And that's what we're trying to do as a coach with you is to just take you up the levels of this computer game of under 10s or under 11s. And then we're going to play the under 12 computer game and then the under 13, the under 14. And you know that if you keep practicing and you keep getting better at it, you will crack that game. And it doesn't matter how long it takes, as long as you crack it at the end. We have a question here from Mathilde. And Mathilde is based in France, hasn't played a competitive game for about six months. Um, COVID restrictions and everything that kind of goes along with that. Um, how would you advise her to kind of mentally prepare? How do you get your head in the zone um, to, for return to uh, competition tennis? Okay. The first thing is to know is that most of the people she's going to play about play against are in the same boat. So again, don't, don't automatically give everybody else more credit for handling COVID better than she has. Okay. Um, the second thing is naturally as a tennis player, you've learned a lot of resilience because to be a tennis player, you are, you are training yourself to be, be resilient. So you have resilience in you already. And this is a great test of that resilience. How can I cope in this situation? And the other thing is to ask yourself this question. Okay, you know, I haven't played a competitive match for six months or nine months. You know, I just wonder how good I'm actually going to be. Because for sure, mentally, I'm very well rested. You know, physically, I hope she's been, he or she has been doing work and, and is in physical good shape so i'm in great physical shape and you know it's possible that after a few practice sessions and that my body feels amazing and i'm actually going to you know very quickly play better tennis so kind of going to it with again a sense of adventures i just wonder what's going to happen and how long it's going to take me to 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 get back to my level or am i going to surprise myself and be at an even better level uh very quickly Okay, Dave, we'll just do one last question um, yeah. before I pass back to Fabio and wrap it up. Um, if I was a tennis player or if anyone was a tennis player, what would you recommend for me to do if I was on the change events, on the changeover? You know, sometimes you're watching TV and you see pros with the towel over the head. Like, you sometimes wonder, like, are they working on their breathing exercises? Are they meditating? What's going through their head? Like, what would you recommend for a player on the change of ends and to try and stay in that zone? Um, again, you know, tennis is such a personal sport. You have to find what works for you. And that's why you see so many different reactions at a changeover, because everybody has their own way of coping with the pressure of coping with their own thoughts uh, and, and, and dealing with everything. So there is no one way. I would suggest that you experiment and see what works for you. But one thing that is really, you know, universal is the dialogue that goes on inside your head. Whatever you're feeling in that changeover, you want to try and get calm again. You can even imagine something like a thermometer and say, you know, I'm at boiling point right now. I'm so angry and everything like that. Before I play, I need to bring the thermometer down to in a normal temperature. You know, so that's another little visual. Yeah, you you wanna you wanna start each game in a calm but also energized place. You, you, you don't walk out there like, I'm so calm and have no energy, you know? So you, you got to find, you know, your, your energy level that, that helps your feet to move well and for you to play well and a level of calmness in your mind that works for you. How you get that is, as I said, you know, uh, and that's where a coach is very useful to give you lots of different examples that other players use and for you to try out and then get good at one that really starts to resonate with you and work for you. Because for some people, a towel over the head 
that feel claustrophobic and like hot and you know bothered other people just love it because it cuts everything else out so it's 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 a very personal journey this but that's what makes it so fantastic good man dave uh, perfect thank, thanks dave thank you very much for that you're right i think you say a lot of good there well plenty good but it comes down to ex experimentation find out what works for you you're very right tennis is an individual sport and just like we use individual equipment we've individual strokes what works for you in a mental preparation and maintenance is down to experiment and see everybody's going to be different but you know, it's good to hear what works for other people because you may take a bit from you a bit from somebody else and then you build your own story from pieces of all these pictures so that's why it's great speaking to people like you and other guests we've on because you know if everybody takes one little thing from all the people we've on you help build a better player and that's only you're trying to be a better player and you're trying to get better every day and as you say you're just trying to get up to the levels that's correct so, yeah yeah um, it's a it's an exciting journey and and i think you know uh basically try not to take yourself too seriously through this uh, and i know it's difficult but you know it is just a game and it's a game that you're trying to master and get better and better at and and you know that bird's eye view the owl up there and saying yeah you know at the end of the day you started this game to have fun and it's amazing you know people start and they love tennis and they and then suddenly they get good and they're not having fun anymore because it all becomes it's not fun if i don't win mm, that's not why you started you started because it was fun and so keep playing and having fun with it whilst getting tougher and tougher and tougher yes i'm not saying results mean nothing of course they mean they mean something but they you know they're not worth anything if you're not having fun and you will burn out if if it's no fun you know you always hear top competitors in any sport say i'll quit the day that i'm not having fun anymore yeah no i agree with you there and tam just maybe just briefly talk to us before you go about not sure if many people know the mindset college it's you run an online course that you know helps people give my dears trains and maybe you can tell me more about it and we leave it at that then yeah uh, mindset college basically declutters your mind so some of the lessons that you know i've talked about here but it's a very detailed course which a lot of the questions that were asked today uh would be answered in the course um it it's not just about dealing with how your mindset is on on the court it's also about dealing with things that happen off the court so you know there are subjects you know like uh you know confrontation you know how how to you know talk to a coach if you don't agree with what they're saying um uh things like uh introversion and judgment and labeling and comparison uh it, you know how to prepare somebody asked how to prepare for for matches uh it's all in there how to set goals from the heart uh it is a very very uh intense intense is in a in a fun way course that takes care of pretty much all your questions plus uh every month i come on if you buy the course uh with a webinar to answer questions and give additional sort of upgrades and thinking uh around it so you know if 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 you want to get mentally strong for tennis and you want to have a healthy mindset for tennis uh it's it's a great investment and i know from so many athletes that have succeeded and are doing well who use mindset college uh that the proof is there it works and i have you know over 30 years of experience and a lot of uh, study behind this uh it works and who's it for is it for young juniors players of all ages for parents for coaches uh it's it i would say for uh 14 and under uh and we would do this we would give access to the parent and to the player because it's it's important that the the parent takes the messages and can really have the discussions with the with the younger player 
and and they know their kid really well so they know what will resonate with them best and 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 put it into language that they understand uh best uh 14 plus uh is for anybody and of course for coaches it's a great way of getting you know great new tools to use for 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 your players and uh and and gives you a mental skills program really um uh uh what's the word i'm looking for um in a methodical way because it's a very methodical course and so for players and coaches it's a methodical way of really learning how the mindset needs to be and how to learn a healthy mindset for for playing tennis and and honestly it really does declutter your mind it it, it makes things uh, a lot simpler for for people to understand okay well look, hope that makes uh, sense it, uh, it does a little i probably need to look a bit deeper look at the page and that's what i'm going to do i'm going to uh, everybody who's here i'm going to send a recording of this around in the next 24 hours i'll put a link up to dave's information his pages his mind the mindset college he's going to give me some crazy offer for you guys i don't know what it is yet but i'll have that yeah. him, have that in the email and that's it any questions you can mail him or you can mail me and forward them on to him. But uh, thanks a lot, Dave, for coming on here. As usual, I've learned something today. I hope everybody else has. And yeah, best of luck with Liam and with Marcus, who we've had on the podcast. Yes. We love Marcus. Uh, best of luck with those guys and with Mindset College over the next, in the future. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and thanks for having me. And I see people there saying, thanks a lot on the chat uh thank you i really appreciate you taking the time out i know everybody's v busy and you know to take time out and listen uh to what i have to say uh, i don't take it for granted in any way and uh i try to stay humble with it <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, you must be the most relaxed guy in the world i'm going to test you someday and we see how relaxed you are <laughs> please do yeah, thanks a lot. i can maybe learn something thanks a lot bye thanks everybody. very much bye, bye, bye. cheers thanks